بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد خاتم النبيين وإمام المرسلين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This is lesson 4 in explaining المنفرجة The poem by Imam Ibn al-Nahawi And uh, in the last uh, lesson we stopped The last line that we covered was فهناك العيش وبهجته فلمبتهج ولمنتهج So now we're going to go on to the next line And he says فهج الأعمال إذا ركدت فإذا ما هجت إذا انتهج فهج is حاجة when you say حاجة الشيء يعني أثاره أو حركه when you do هيجان for something you're moving it you're getting it going in an excited type of way it's not just slightly moving it and so he's saying here إذا ركدت meaning إذا سكنت or if it's become stagnant so what he's saying is get your actions moving if and and excited if they happen to be stagnant for فَإِذَا مَا هِشْتَ For if you're consistent in getting them moving, they'll become consistent as well. Now, consistency is key. The Prophet Sallallahu said, أَحَبُّ الْأَعْمَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَدْوَمُهَا وَإِنْ قَلْ The most beloved actions to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala are ones where you have uh, consistency with them, even if they're little. The companions, Radwanullahi Alayhim, may Allah be pleased with them, when they picked up an action, they didn't let it go. So if they picked up something like, let's say, he's going to pray two rak'ats after Maghrib or before Dhuhr or just a random one during the day, like there's a companion that used to pray before he left his house, he used to always do two rak'ats. And he just wanted his last type of action before he left would be, uh, just in case he passed away, would be that he prayed two rak'ats. Uh, Bilal ibn Rabah, for example, he used to pray after every... Uh, Bilal ibn Rabah, uh, عنه, was actually an interesting one. The Prophet ﷺ, heard footsteps in heaven preceding him and he was wondering well, what's that so he looked into it and he found out it was Bilal so he went to Bilal and asked him what, were you be, what have you been doing and Bilal said oh messenger of Allah I can't think of anything else except that I've always made it a habit that whenever I lose my wudu to go and renew it and then after I renew it to pray two rak'ats two cycles of prayer so that's something that he did um, whenever he picked it up, he just continued with it. So it's best that if you pick something up, it's not good to start doing big things and then stop. It's better for you to pick something and just stick with it. And make sure that it's something you can actually sustain, not something that you pick up for a couple of weeks and then stop. Um, Imam Nahwi here is basically directing us in this line. Now after he fixed basically an understanding of uh, how the world runs and basically correcting your living aqidah, not your didactic theology. He's correcting your belief in your heart about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this world and how everything is running. After he fixed that, he's telling you what to do in order for you to change your condition. And he's saying, فَهِجِ الْأَعْمَالَ إِذَا رَكَدَ Your actions are stagnant. Now we said in the previous lesson that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you tribulation to get you closer to Him. So when you have this tribulation, it's actually an opportunity for you to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and start doing some works. Start getting your act, go, your act together. Um, and that's basically how to change your current condition. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, Allah does not change the condition of a people until they change what's within themselves. Now, this doesn't have to necessarily be strictly just praying. Um, let's say you have a financial difficulty. And I'll tell you, uh, this is from personal experience of someone I know that's uh, near and dear to me. He had financial difficulty, and so what did he do? Rather than um, trying to borrow money and do this, he had just a little bit of money left. And in his city, and this is in, uh, this is in uh, Sudan, near his home was a masjid that was basically run down. People were still using it, but it wasn't well kept or well maintained. He took the money that he had, and instead of trying to figure a way to uh, have the lenders basically give him more time, I'll just give you payment or anything, he took that money, and he made a deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he actually renew, renovated the masjid. After renovating the masjid, things started pouring down for him. Just blessings started coming. So this is what it means to فهيج الأعمال إذا ركدت. It's you basically look at your situation and reflect upon it and see what can you do where you can make basically a, amends with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because your relationship has been broken a little bit. So you make amends and you do the right action in order for you to um, 
do well, do good uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what it means to uh, get your actions going. And once you get them going, stay consistent with it. Don't just do it so that you can get out of trouble and then stop. No, it's something that you pick up and you continue doing. After that, he says, That uh, the ugliness of disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ugliness, the ugly acts of that uh, one does in disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they become beautified for the one with an ugly character. So, if you are actually able to see the reality of, um, of sin itself and the damage that it does to the soul, its reality is very ugly. It's not a, it's not a good thing. Now, and when one does a sin, they're harming their soul. They're damaging themselves. It's interesting that the word sin itself, um, it comes from, uh, the word sin it's an archer's term, um, which means to miss the mark. If you're uh, taking uh, arrows and you're just shooting with archery and you are trying to get at a target, you're trying to get the bullseye, if you miss it, you say, I've sinned. The same thing is done in Arabic, al hadaf. The understanding behind that is that when you do that, you're actually um, trying to benefit your soul, but you're not doing it properly you're actually taking the wrong course of action and you end up down like when somebody looks at something um, like impermissible when you get a dust in your eye you see how bothersome it is for your eye and how damaging it is for the eye when you're looking at something impermissible it's like taking an ice pick and just jabbing your internal eye your inner eye that's what you're doing with that you think you're benefiting yourself but in fact you're not thing is when someone has basically istamra um, adhamb, someone that has gotten used to this type of lifestyle, has gotten used to sinning, has, and actually has taken it upon themselves as, as a character trait, that sin no longer looks bad. It actually looks beautiful. So to give you an example, someone, rather than being called a fornicator, and if you listen to the, if you take the word itself, it doesn't sound too good. So so-and-so is a fornicator. They're no longer a fornicator, they're a player now. They slay the ladies. I mean, you, you see in, in uh, Western culture all kinds of terms that make it sound like it's something uh, uh, good for someone to be like that. Um, but that's a sign of a bad character. And then he gives you the contrast to that in the next line. He says, And for his obedience and its beauty are lights of a clear morning, a clear manifest morning. Now, if you looked at uh, people that spend their years worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, avoiding that which is sinful, doing all the commands and observing everything, you'll actually see them like, a, like light is coming and emanating from them. It's the beauty of obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you see saintly figures, um, people that have spent years and years in prayer and in uh, Quran recitation, you actually see the effect of it on their faces. Whereas people that spend their years in uh, hedonistic lifestyle, you see the negative aspect of that. Uh, case in point, look at somebody like a saint and compare them to somebody like a rock star that spent their years just, you know, doing everything that their ego and lower self wants, whereas someone that's been fighting it. And you'll see the difference. Someone that has spent their years in life in obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just light and beauty emanates from them. And it's really well, no it's readily noticeable. And if you've been around people like that, I've been around people that like uh, somebody like uh, Dr. Umar Farooq Abdullah. I believe, Allahu A'lam, but, uh, but for us we just judge by the external. Dr. Umar Farooq, I believe that he's someone that's close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're walking in uh, Turkey and you'll see people just come up to Dr. Umar. Random people. They've never met him. They want to kiss his hand. They want to uh, shake his hand. They want to just get close to him and talk to him and just uh, ask him for advice and it's just random people now Dr. Omar you see him it's just light emanates even if you see him in pictures amongst uh, groups of people he just stands out now that's someone that spent his years his life is spent in remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reciting the Quran and seeking sacred knowledge that's what he's been doing and you'll see and you see it in his face you see it you see the effect of it someone else on the other hand like I don't know Mick Jagger all you gotta do is just google a picture of him and you'll see what I mean 
So this is what it means what anwaru sabahan is manifest. And beauty is usually associated with daytime. Um, ugliness and fear and sins are usually associated with nighttime. And the reason for that is because people want to hide it. Whereas beauty is something that I mean flowers, um, trees, everything blossoms in the daytime. You see it all happening in the daytime. At nighttime, most of the things just shut down. And that's when people go into the bar and that's when people go and try to hide. Because it's something that is, their soul recognizes that it's something shameful. They don't want to do. مَنْ يَخْطُبَ حُورَ الْخُلْدِ بِهَا يَثْفَرُ بِالْحُورِ وَبِالْغُنُجِ Or وَبِالْغَنَجِ Or you'll hear it in another version, وَبِالْفَنَجِ مَنْ يَخْطُبَ حُورَ الْخُلْدِ بِهَا Whoever asks for an engagement, whoever engages, gets an engagement with uh, women of the eternal hereafter, حُورَ الْخُلْدِ which are the uh, حُورَ الْعِينِ يَغْفَرُ بِالْحُورِ وَبِالْفَنَجِ or الْغَنَجِ or الْغُنُجِ will win the acceptance of those, the most beautiful ones in heaven. Now, the metaphor is for marriage because marriage is, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مِثَاقًا غَلِيظًا it's a, it's a very heavy, uh, weighty covenant. And so when you take, if one uses, biha uh, is referring back to ta'atillah, to obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You use that as the dowry for you to get al-hur al to get the uh, maid, the maids and uh, the huris in, uh, in heaven. That's your dowry. If that's what you're using, He's telling you, يَثْفَرُ You will win the most beautiful ones. And حُورَ الْعِينِ is referring to, the reason they were named Huris is because um, their eyes, the whiteness is really white, and the black part, the pupil is really black. Like it's more so than you can imagine. And that's where that name, the bayad, the, real, the whiteness is just light emanating from their, from their eyes. And from here, from this point on, uh, when he says, مَنْ يَخْتُبُ حُورَ الْخُلْدِ بِهَا Now Imam al-Nahawi, and notice, like we, I keep referring back to the aqidah part where he's fixing your living aqidah. Now he's going to go into the, uh, the recipe for how to win these huris and how to uh, get this tribulation lifted from you. And, then he's, uh, and for that he says, فَكُنَ الْمَرْضِيَّ لَهَا بِتُقَنْ تَرْضَاهُ غَدًا وَتَكُونَ نَجِي Be accepting of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you with through piety and have piety and taqwa of Allah and I'll get into that in a second Tardahu ghadan you'll be satisfied on the everlasting day day of judgment ghadan refers to the day of judgment وتكون نجي and you'll be saved this refers back to the contentment with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for you and to do it with taqwa to do it with uh, knowledge of an awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now taqwa normally you'll have a lot of people translating it as fear of Allah if you just restrict it to that, it becomes an inaccurate translation. Taqwa is more than that. Taqwa comes from the word wiqaya. Wiqaya is a protection. It's a protection that you form between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this protection is through, um, which has been defined as al-imtithalu uh, lil-awamir uh, wa nawahi It's to uh, uphold and do the commands and observe the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stay away from that which he uh, deemed impermissible. Now, that's usually the definition you'll get it stopped at. I like what Sidi Abdul Wahid ibn Ashir in his Urjuza in, uh, in Matna al Murshid al Mu'in, he defines taqwa with a little bit more definition than that. He said, وَحَاصِلُ التَّقْوَى إِمْتِثَالٌ وَاجْتِنَابٌ ظَاهِرًا وَبَاطِنًا بِهَا تُنَالُ إِجْتِنَابٌ وَامْتِثَالٌ يَا نَعْمَ ظَاهِرُ التَّقْوَى إِجْتِنَابٌ وَامْتِثَالٌ ظاهراً وباطناً بذاتناً. That's how the line goes in Ibn Ashim. What does that mean? It says the achievement of taqwa will be through um, getting اجتناب uh, وامتثال. Uh, it's actually staying away from and امتثال is actually to observe. ظاهراً وباطناً. It's to do that externally and باطناً and internally. بذاتناً. And that's how you'll get taqwa. Externally, you might show taqwa, you might show that you're observing the commands and staying away from the, pro the prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But internally, you might have uh, a desire towards the opposite of that. To give you an example, uh, you see someone drinking alcohol. In externally, if, if they offer it to you, you say, no, I don't want to. Internally, if you still desire that drink, you haven't achieved full taqwa yet. You've only gone halfway. 
Now, you, the rewards are based on what you do. So this is not to say that if you internally desire something, then if you, then you, that would make you a sinner. No, we're just saying that on the day that Allah says, We're talking about a sound heart and a belief and a creed that's in your heart that you live. Internally, if you desire that drink, you got a problem. You need to actually be internally not wanting that drink. Give you uh, another more uh, relevant example for the men. See a beautiful girl walking down the street. Externally, you lower your gaze and you say Astaghfirullah. But internally, you should also be lowering your gaze internally. And you should be telling yourself not to seek that out. And yourself should not be wanting that. That's what it means to have proper taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to form that protection for your heart. And so the first thing, and it's the a'dham al it's the it's the highest of character. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ وَصَيْنَا الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَإِيَّاكُمْ أَنْ اتَّقُوا اللَّهِ We have, uh, we have uh, given counsel to the ones that have come before you and for you to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to have this awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to form this protection internally and externally so that we don't fall into problematic um, uh, situations that will damage our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so fear is part of it but that's not the whole thing it's uh, and and it's not it's an awe it's uh, there's a lot to it taqwa um, and that's why it's not really a, an accurate translation to just say fear and then after that he tells you and recite the Qur'an with a heart that has uh, a little bit of sadness in it and a voice that is soft and sad as well. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Muzammil وَرَتِّلُ الْقُرْآنَ التَّرْتِيلَ And in uh, At-Tirmidhi he narrates a narration where the, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says مَنْ شَغَلَهُ الْقُرْآنُ عَنْ ذِكْرِ وَمَسْأَلَتِي Whoever is too busy with the Qur'an You know some people just That's all they do They recite Qur'an all day long And that's their time spent doing that Whoever is busy doing a lot of Qur'an recitation And so busy that they actually don't make dua And they don't ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for things Now recognize that in the Qur'an there is ad'iyah There is dua in the Qur'an as you recite it You know Rabbana uh, آتنا في الدنيا حسنا ربنا لا تؤخذنا بما فعل ربنا اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد had a blank right now but you have a lot of dua in the Quran that you do um, as you do these dua you're making dua so you're not losing out on the dua but Allah here is telling you that whoever is doing so much Quran that you forget to start asking me for things that you want because you're being busy with the Qur'an, Allah will give you the best of what He has given people that do ask for things. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, فَضْلُ كَلَامِ, الـ, uh, كلام الـ, uh, كلام الله على سائر الكلام. The, uh, the extra, the, the, the status of uh, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over all other, word, all other talk is like, it's like when you compare Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the rest of creation. There's no comparison. So if you're spending your time in recitation of the Quran and spending it just uh, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, khalas, you, you're basically covering yourself. Um, and whatever calamity you have upon you, it will just be lifted if that's what you're busying yourself with. The next thing he tells you is, وَصَلَاتُ اللَّيْلِ وَمَسَافَتُهَا فَذْهَبْ فِيهَا بِالْفَهْمِ وَجِهِ And for the night prayer and its time that you spend reciting, go through it with intellect in return. Go through this night with actual presence of mind. Um, the night prayer is actually, uh, the, uh, the night optional prayer is better than the daily optional prayers. And At-Tabarani uh, narrates that شَرَفُ uh, الْمُؤْمِنْ قِيَامُ الْلَيْلِ Prophet ﷺ said the honor of a believer is the night vigil, is standing up at night and praying. Um, when you do that, and it's the time that you recite the most, and it's not about doing so many rak'ats and doing a lot of, you know, he prayed like 20, 30, 40, no, it's not about that. If you just pray two rak'ats at night, and each one you spent like an hour 
because you were just reciting a lot of Quran, that's that might actually benefit you more than just reciting, just praying quickly and just getting 20 done. Um, and, and to do that with presence of mind. And the nighttime, one of the reasons it's better than the daytime is because that's when everything calms down. You know, that's the time where it's tranquil. That's when the mind is at most ease. That's when there is no more busyness in the world. And that's the time where you can actually have a proper khalwa with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have an isolation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and just basically recite what Allah has revealed to His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so that's the next step that you take in changing your condition. And reflect upon it and its meanings. You'll arrive at paradise and be relieved. Now, reflecting upon it meaning reflect upon the purpose of what you're doing. What is the purpose behind the night prayer and the night vigil and upholding these things and reciting the Quran and what is the meaning that you're getting from reciting the Quran in addition to the meanings that you derive from your reflection upon whatever it is that you're reciting. That's true reflection. It's not just about um, only reflecting upon what you're reciting. The whole meaning behind it. When you do your ruku', when you do your sujood, when you do your standing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the purpose is behind every action that you're doing. The purpose behind even the meaning behind Allahu Akbar to even reflect upon that he's telling you that you need to basically put your A game on and get your reflection uh, antenna on to its most clear uh, station so that you can get the most out of it and only through that uh, you will actually experience the change in your state uh, At-Tirmidhi narrates uh, the Prophet ﷺ says Alaykum bi qiyamul layl Take upon yourselves the night vigil and standing up at night and praying. For it is the way of the righteous ones that have come before you. And it brings you nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't have all these distractions in the daytime. At night time, you can get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمُكَفِّرَةٌ لِسَيِّئَاتِ And it expiates the sins, the minor sins that we do. وَمُطْرِدَةٌ لِلْدَّائِئِ فِي عَنِ الْجِسْمِ And it basically wards off the illness and the harm from the body. It's interesting, they've actually done a study recently that um, in the past people never slept for eight continuous hours. And we're talking about Muslims on Muslims. The, the ancient people, the way they slept was they would sleep a portion of the night and then they would get up for the last portion and continue about their day. And they would just have a nap in the daytime. So, and it's actually healthier for you to do this. To sleep continuous eight hours is actually oversleeping. Um, pop culture is not always right when it comes to this. Uh, and it stops you from committing major sins. When Allah says, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغِيِ يَعِذُكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَّكَّرُونَ What does that mean when uh, Allah says uh, that prayer, تَنْهَاكُمْ uh, It stops you from, it wards you from عن الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغِيِ Major sins, فَحْشُ الشَّيْءِ is like something that's manifestly wrong. It's not just something minor, we're talking about something majorly wrong. وَالْمُنْكَرِ مُنْكَرِ مَنْكَرُ وَالْقَوْمِ What the people actually don't, don't accept as part of the custom. And it's something that's also a transgression. Baghi uh, is oppression. How does prayer ward that off? It doesn't do it just through the act of it. There's a lot of people that you see, and I can, you know, everybody can think of people that pray all the time, but when they go in their business transactions, they cheat everyone. When they go home, they're oppressing their family. Um, and when they deal with people, they deal in the most negative and, you know, aberrant of ways with people. That means their prayer is not being conducted properly. If you're active worship, if you come out of your active worship uh, either as an unchanged person or as uh, having not experienced change before and just come as uh, either worse or the same, you got a problem with that active worship. It's not, uh, it could not, it might even not be as uh, accepted because there was no sincerity in it. When you're really reflecting and when you're really into it, and you really uh, get the meanings and the purpose behind what you're doing physically and what you're reciting and what the meanings are, 
that is going to stop you. It will become an internal kind of uh, check for you. Um, and that's what it means by Manhattan al Ithmi. And then he says, and this will be the last line we'll cover, وَشْرَبْ تَسْنِيمَ مُفَجِّرِهَا لَا مُمْتَزِجًا وَبِمُمْتَزِجِ And drink from the tasneem uh, that's uh, being gushed forth uh, with mixed and unmixed drink. Tasneem is a spring in heaven. It's a ayn in heaven. And um, the close, يَشْرَبُ مِنْهَا الْمُقَرَّبُونَ uh, it's uh, the close servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the awliya, this is what they drink from. Now, the drink is called tasneem because it actually flows in the air and then comes into the cups of the uh, believers. So it literally flies up in the air and then comes down. That's what the name tasneem comes from. Mixed and unmixed. Some will drink it pure, not diluted. There's no diluted in it. Uh, there's no dilution in it. And that will be for the real close ones. Uh, Al-Abrar will drink it a little bit diluted and mixed with other things. Both of them will be from the winning uh, group anyways. But the closer you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more pure the pleasure that you experience in heaven will be. And so this is basically the, the manhaj. If you notice, he spent a few lines you know, before that correcting aqidah. Just getting the aqidah corrected and just making sure that you believe uh, your belief about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the world is proper. Once you get that settled down, after that it's no big deal. All you have to do is And then after that And then after that And then and then وَتَأَمَّلَهَا وَمَعَانِيهَا تَعْتِ الْفِرْدَوْسَ وَتَنْفَرِجِ And وَشْرَبْ تَسْنِيمَ مُفَجِّرِهَا لَا مُمْتَزِجًا وَمُمْتَزِجِ That's it. You'll actually, even the last one, you'll just end up وَشْرَبْ تَسْنِيمَ You'll end up winning and drinking from Tasneem. So the actual acts, a lot of Muslims, the, the problem that we have today is they feel like the only thing that will get you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is simply through just prayer. And there's actually a lot more to it than that. There are people that pray minimally but their state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is higher than people that pray a lot. And that is due to what their heart is actually uh, taken in and settled into it. So this is what this poem is about. It's just correcting aqidah and then getting you to do the right actions um, before finally making the dua, which is inshallah what we'll uh, get into. We'll finish off the poem in the next lesson. Um, so just the lines again that we covered today. فَهِجِ الْأَعْمَالَ إِذَا رَكَدَتْ فَإِذَا مَا هِجْتَ إِذَا انْتَهِجِ وَمَعَاصِ اللَّهِ وَسَمَاجَتِهَا تَزْدَانُ لِذِي الْخُلُقِ السَّمِجِ وَلِطَاعَتِهِ وَصَبَاحَتِهَا أَنْوَارُ صَبَاحٍ مُنْبَلِجِ مَنْ يَخْطُبُ حُورَ الْخُلْدِ بِهَا يَفْفَرُ بِالْحُورِ وَبِالْغَنَجِ فَكُنِ الْمَرْضِيَّ لَهَا بِتُقَنْ تَرْضَاهُ غَدًا وَتَكُونَ نَجِي وَاتْلُ الْقُرْآنَ بِقَلْبٍ ذِي حَزَنٍ وَبِصَوْتٍ فِيهِ شَجِي وتأملها ومعانيها تأتي الفردوس وتنفرج وشرب تسنيم مفجرها لا ممتزجا وبممتزج. إن شاء الله you're uh, benefiting from this. Um, you're getting uh, the meanings uh, more readily now, and the poem is starting to hopefully sound more beautiful to you because now you understand the meanings and what the whole in intent behind what Ibn Al Nahwi was saying. بارك الله فيكم. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين. والحمد لله رب العالمين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك إن شاء الله و continue with the final lesson um, in lesson five السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته